nice to be back uh, in New York at this uh, event again. I hope we've got our books in the back there somewhere that we get to take with us. <laughs> um, my name is Greg Johnson, President and CEO of South American Silver. Um, pleased to be able to uh, present our company uh, here to you today. Uh, I think we've got a very interesting emerging story. I think you'll find this is a story that's not well known in the marketplace. Uh, we've been one of the top performing silver companies on a, the last two year basis. Uh, but it's still very early days, and I think the value situation on this story, I think, is, is quite compelling. Um, we are going to be making forward-looking statements, and uh, I strongly suggest that investors take a look at our annual information form to document the various risks and uncertainties having to do with the mining business. <clears throat> Uh, maybe just a bit of an introduction first off. Um, my background, uh, this is my second co public company. I'm one of the original co-founders at Nova Gold. I was there for a, a dozen years and helped uh, as part of the team growing that company from about a $50 million market cap to about a $2 billion company when I left. I was first introduced to South American Silver as an investor in 2007 for their IPO. I was one of the larger private investors that invested in the company. At that point, it was just an exploration concept. There were no resources, but you know, one of the most impressive silver targets that I had seen in my career, uh, and a second very interesting looking asset in Chile uh, that was a copper gold asset. Um, in 2009, they asked me to join the board of directors. That gave me the opportunity to get to know the team and the assets better, and then in 2010, the company undertook a full-time CEO search and I was looking for the right opportunity to, to jump into. Uh, I saw two potentially world-class assets, uh, a company that didn't have a lot of market exposure yet, and a huge opportunity in terms of growth. And it was really the, the early days at Nova Gold where we were a small technical team that was the exciting part in terms of building a company, and that's what I, I hope to bring here. Uh, two key assets in the company, the Malkukota Silver Indian Project is our most advanced asset. Uh, we are currently in the final stages of an engineering update on this project that will be out next month, uh, looking at uh, production, projection uh, increase, and overall optimization. But our study from last May indicated a project producing about 13 million ounces of silver a year, making it a top 10 silver producer. And our target in the next study is looking at something between 18 and 20 million ounces a year, so making it a truly world-class silver asset. In addition to the silver, it has one of the highest concentrations of indium and gallium of any project in the world. These are two high technology metals. And one of the things we'll talk about in the presentation is the fact that we've recently uh, taken in a strategic investment by a number of Asian groups interested in those indium and gallium technology metals uh, to help facilitate development of the project. And this could potentially be one of the largest producers of those key strategic metals in the Western world. The second asset is the Escalones Copper Gold Project located in central Chile. This is one of the most productive copper belts in the world. Uh, we're right next door to the El Teniente mine, which is the largest underground copper mining complex. Uh, just early days, but we tabled this brand new resource in January of this year. Uh, so this is something the market has yet to fully digest, but we think there's tremendous value potential in this project. Uh, as well. Um, as many of you know, it's been a challenging market over the last 18 months in the sector. Companies are trading at uh, uh, really valuations almost uh, rarely seen in the last decade. Um, and I think it's a real opportunity looking at, at names here in the market uh, today. So looking quickly at the, uh, the first asset, the Malcocota project, it's located in central Bolivia, which is historically one of the largest producing regions for silver uh, located uh, in here. Uh, the project is already, in all categories, nearly 400 million ounces, so it's truly a world-class silver resource. And you've got about 2,500 tons of indium content and about 2,000 tons of gallium. So all in, if you treat this as kind of equivalent value to silver, you're looking at a project in excess of 500 to 600 million ounces equivalent value. Uh, and in today's trading prices, indium and gallium are in kind of the $600 a kilo price range. If you price those in ounces, they would be similar to the price of silver. So you can almost, on a value basis, treat them as, uh, as silver value. Second asset, the Escalonius Copper Project uh, here in central Chile. As you can see, we've got about 400 million ton resource at about a half a percent copper when you include the copper plus the, uh, the gold and silver and Mali Valley. Uh, this thing is wide open to further expansion. Uh, by copper standards, even though 
on an equivalent basis, this is worth about 400 million ounces of silver. Uh, as a copper project, it's still relatively modest in size, and we believe there's a lot of room to continue to grow this asset. We're actively drilling it. Um, we are coming to the end of the drill season in central Chile as we're getting into winter. Um, so we'll probably be wrapping up this month, and we'll look to bring those uh, round of drilling there, plus metallurgical test work into the company to support a first preliminary economic assessment by late this year. Um, one of the first things that investors, when they're looking at South American silver, want to talk to us about is just, you know, Bolivia. You know, can you do business effectively as a mining company in Bolivia? What are the analogs? Um, you know, how can you feel comfortable, you know, working in this uh, emerging economy? Uh, Bolivia is one of the poorest countries in South America on a per capita income basis. Uh, but they also are one of the richest in terms of resources. Uh, mining is the second largest economic sector after oil and gas, and it's a critical component to them building an economy there. Uh, they've seen a lot of change over the last six years under the Morales administration, uh, including embodying uh, the concept of indigenous rights and consultation into their constitution. And much like the trend we've seen throughout the Andean region, uh, this concept of greater indigenous autonomy and local say is, is really quite prevalent uh, here in Bolivia. And in fact, one could argue it's more mature than the, the trends we're seeing in other locales such as Peru, Argentina, and other locations where recently projects have been held up due to lack of indigenous consultation. To us, local is key. If you can work well with your local indigenous communities, that's really one of the keys to unlocking value uh, in a, an emerging economy like Bolivia. And to that end, uh, we have our team collectively has been working down here uh, for nearly 20 years. So we've been on the ground for a long time in Bolivia. This is the former Chevron Minerals South American Exploration Team. Uh, and uh, we've been through kind of the ups and downs, if you will, uh, in Bolivia. Uh, we see things actually continuing to move towards the positive from a mining perspective. And we're seeing strong support from our local indigenous communities. We spent the last year really focused on uh, working with them, developing impact and benefit agreements with these uh, local indigenous communities. And they are, have formed a coalition and are actually lobbying on behalf of the project in La Paz and Potosí. Uh, the model we've used here is the same model that was used at Sumitomo's San Cristobal mine, which is the third largest silver mine in the world located in Bolivia. Uh, they basically formed a coalition with the six local IUs, which are these land-owning indigenous groups. And those groups over time developed service businesses and other benefits that came in from the, the project itself. This was also similar to what was used by Newmont at Interami. Uh, and we've modeled uh, you know, the programs that we're doing off that. This is not necessarily expensive. It's something that takes time, commitment, and it's really about respecting the local culture, involving them in the business opportunities, the service businesses related to the development of mine. This is very much a win-win situation when you have this on board. Uh, so we feel <clears throat> quite good that we're building a base towards social license that's gonna be key to helping to uh, mitigate the risk of working in a developing country like Bolivia. Uh, looking at our share capital structure, about 115 million shares outstanding. This is uh, subsequent to the financing we completed earlier this month with the Asian technology investors. Um, we're looking at a market cap today. This is, looks like it's a little bit out of date. Around $160 million market cap uh, today. A trading volume around 150,000 shares a day. So we're, we're actually, for a smaller cap name, a fairly liquid. We're looking to move towards a QX listing here in the near term. Uh, to provide better liquidity here in the U.S., but we're a full TSX listed company now. In terms of holders of the stock, uh, management owns 9% of the shares directly. Uh, this recent investment with the Asian technology investors uh, was about a 9% level investment. We have two other um, private equity groups, the Zemin Group out of the U.K. and Azurium. Uh, Zemin particularly is focused in southern South America, looking at investment in assets, particularly iron ore. Uh, in Brazil, Uruguay, and Bolivia, and they've been a, a good supporter of the company. And institutionally, um, some, some of the usual suspects, Broad Asset Management's our largest individual shareholder, Front Street, U.S. Global. Uh, institutional ownership is clearly an, one that will look to grow uh, at, uh, you know, about 22%. There's a lot of room for this number to, to go up pretty considerably. Track record of growth for the company uh, since its uh, founding in 2007 uh, with the initial IPO of just $20 million based on the fact that there were no resources in the ground, a fairly humble start. But within a single year, we had grown to 100 million ounce silver resource in the ground, 
grown that to about 200 million ounces by 2009. Uh, I came on board in 2010 and uh, helped facilitate about $36 million in financing that year. That allowed us to accelerate the activities uh, on the Silver Indian project, which resulted in a significant increase in resources in 2011. And it allowed us to queue up work on the Copper Gold project, which had been in the asset uh, in our portfolio mix, but had not actively been worked on since its discovery back in the late 90s, actually by this, this team at Chevron Minerals. Uh, so in the last year, we've tabled a second resource, this 4 billion pound copper resource, which is a more than, uh, if you look at it, almost doubled our in the ground metal value when you look at silver plus copper value in the ground. And we've been growing our ounces per share quite consistently uh, since the initial formation of the company. Looking at how this stacks up against other assets that are out there in the silver space, this is looking at silver only, not silver equivalent. Uh, this list is from the Canaccord and BMO Capital Markets Explorer developer list, really looking at uh, assets in silver in the Americas as our peer set here. Uh, on this chart, we're the third largest total resource when you look at measured indicated plus inferred ounces, similar in size uh, to Bear Creek's um, Coriani project, which is their, their key asset, uh, similar in size to Tahoe Resources in Guatemala's uh, project. Uh, one of the things you'll see when you look at the lower part of this table is with the move in silver from kind of the $5 to $10 range to the current levels in the, the 20s and 30s uh, per ounce, we've seen a real move towards development of bulk mineable deposits, looking at things that are open pitable, either producing a concentrate that's produced, that's smelted, or in our case, as an oxide deposit, direct heap leachable. And that's a trend that we're seeing in silver based on the change in economics of those underlying metals. Our project is fairly unique in that it is all oxide and all leachable. Uh, so that means our economics are quite robust even though the grades are fairly modest. It would be equivalent to a one gram oxide gold heap leach that you might see in Nevada. Um, not your typical high grade underground vein system, which is more typical of the silver mining industry today. Add on it the value for the indium and gallium, and you're looking at the equivalent to something in excess of about $500 million, or 500 million ounces in silver value. If we look in the marketplace today, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty different picture from what it looked like a, a year ago. Um, you know, the values in terms of trading values on an enterprise value per ounce have come down appreciably. Early development stage assets in the silver space are averaging around $2 an ounce today, and we've shown three examples along with ourselves. This isn't the full range of companies at this stage, but just to kind of give you a sense of the range from Tahoe at uh, nearly you know, $8 an ounce and ourselves at around a dollar per recovered ounce. Uh, there's, there's quite a range here. Um, advanced development stage, this is where you're at feasibility. You've got reserves, greater level of technical confidence. The average today is right around $4 an ounce. And if you take the entire basket of North, North American listed silver companies that are in production, they're trading at about $10 an ounce uh, today, which is significantly off of their highs a year ago. So our business plan and business model is really one of advancing, particularly our Malcocota project historically, from the early development stage, resource definition, PEA, through pre-feasibility and feasibility to really maximize value. This is a de-risking process. It involves building the team, raising the capital to be able to advance the project and demonstrate its viability. With the Escalones project added coming into the portfolio, we're taking a bit of a portfolio approach. Uh, it gives us diversification in terms of geopolitical environment. It also gives us two different metal types. Uh, but we're going to be advancing these, at least in the near term, together as we think there's value to be added by having uh, a diversified portfolio uh, of projects in the mix. Uh, certainly as we advance um, on the uh, Malcocota project, if we're starting to see the company trade at a fairer valuation in the marketplace, at some point we'll likely consider, does it make sense to spin this out to shareholders as a, a copper company? Uh, and we'll look at that. We think the opportunity there is, is pretty significant for investors to have exposure currently in us and then later to take a look at options down the road. So taking just a quick snapshot, this is, um, this is our bubble chart. It's modeled after the BMO Capital Markets Exploration Value Screen. And it basically is showing you the relationship between in the ground metal content and enterprise value by stage of company. The silver producers are shown in these silver spheres. The larger the circle, the larger the enterprise value they trade at. And you can see there's a pretty good linear relationship between ounces in the ground and market value. Um, you would expect that an asset at feasibility 
for the same size asset should trade at less than it would be in production because you still have to finance it, you still have to permit it, and you still have to construct it. So you'd expect these blue circles, which represent the advanced development stage, to typically be to the left of the producer valuations for the same size resource. And you'd expect the green, which represent the early development stage, to be the left of those. One of the things you can clearly see is the producers hold together pretty well as a, as a linear band um, in here. But what you can see is that as you start to get to the earlier stage, due to lack of analyst coverage uh, and, and other things, you start to see that the, the variation gets a lot higher. Um, for instance, you can see examples of early development stage companies that are already trading at producer values, and you can see some examples of advanced development stage that are trading at early development stage values. If we look at our company in particular, um, this circle here is our current market value. Uh, for the entire company, including the copper asset. But if you were actually to plot our project, it would sit in this transition from PEA resource stage to pre-feasibility. Uh, so a fairer value using today's trading values would probably be around $300 million or about $3 a share. As we move to feasibility, if we were an average valuation for the space, that's at $4 an ounce level, uh, you'd basically be looking at a project that would be worth about $700 million. And once in production, the company would sit somewhere between, say, Coeur d'Alene here and Hecla or Coeur d'Alene and Hofchilds in terms of potential market value, two to three billion dollar company once financed, built, and operating. So it gives you a sense of the kind of capital appreciation potential an asset like this can have if you're successful in advancing it from stage to stage. I'd like to take a second uh, just to introduce indium and gallium. Uh, I mentioned these early in the presentation. I don't think these are things that the CPM group puts out a yearbook on yet, uh, maybe that's uh, next year. Um, but uh, these are two metals that you may not have heard of, but you use them every day in your life. Uh, basically, anything with a liquid crystal screen is indium tin oxide. It's a transparent semiconductor. Uh, and so your Blackberry, your iPhone, your flat panel television at home, your laptop screen are all indium tin oxide based technologies. That's about 70% of the market. 25% of the market is LED lighting, and this is typically a combination of indium or indium and gallium for the color. And about 5% of the market is this new thin film solar technology, which probably represents about 5% of the market. Uh, this metal is uh, quite a similar, these two metals are quite similar to the heavy rare earths in that they are largely controlled by mainland China, estimated to be about 60 to 70% of the market when you factor mining plus smelting, because most of our indium comes as a byproduct of refining zinc. Uh, they are restricting exports on those metals. And other large flat panel manufacturing um, economies such as Japan, Korea, Taiwan need to look for other secure sources of supply. Uh, people who follow the space closely feel it's just a matter of time before China decides to restrict export further so that there's a price for indium inside China that's lower than the price outside. And, and in that way, they could encourage manufacturing plants to be moved to, to China. Um, the opportunity for us at 80 to say 100 tons a year as our kind of projections on this project, we'd represent about 10% of global supply. But outside of China, we might represent as much as 20% or more of Western supply. Um, so the opportunity for us is to look at this as a potential financing mechanism for the project. And in fact, in this announced uh, financing that was completed earlier this month, we had a number of um, Asian-based materials manufacturers and end users approach the company, take an equity investment at a premium, simply with the objective to facilitate advancement and development of this Western-based indium source. Uh, we have not entered into any kind of discussions or commitments with them on offtake, but the next step as we would go to feasibility would probably be to look at offtake arrangements that might finance the project. Uh, and with such a high level of production you know, potential from this, this is, a, this is a very attractive asset for them to be helping to move along. Uh, already Bolivia uh, is the second largest producing region for indium um, after China. Uh, Tech Cominco, most of their production comes from concentrates sourced in Bolivia. Uh, Sumitomo out of their San Cristobal mine is a major producer of indium. Uh, and then a number of smaller other projects that are sourced uh, either to Korea uh, or other uh, parts of Asia and North America. So this is already a very significant component uh, we would be adding you know, to that with the addition of this uh, production from Malcocota. Looking quickly at, um, at the district that we're working in here, uh, this is an area where mining is not new. They've been mining here since the 16 and 1700s. 
under the Spanish. It's one of the largest historic producing regions for silver. Uh, some four billion ounces have historically been produced, so this puts it on par with the very largest districts in, in Mexico and other places. Uh, since 2005, eight major mines put in place. Glencore Extrata owns five operating mines here in Bolivia. Um, Sumitomo built the San Cristobal mine, which is now the third largest silver mine in the world in 2007. Coeur d'Alene, their second largest operation, uh, is here in Bolivia, built in 2008. Pan American Silver built a mine in 2009, which is their fourth largest mine. And our project uh, is poised to become the next major operating mine, similar in size and scale, uh, potential to San Cristobal. Uh, looking at a photo of the project area, um, these two hills, the sandstone unit, are what host our ore body. Uh, so you're looking at something quite different than a vein system. This is a disseminated sediment hosted system. And for the first several years of mining, it's all ore. So very scalable. R the zones typically are between 100 and 200 meters in thickness at the surface. Open pit mineable. Uh, we'd be looking at crushing this material, putting it on a heap leach, and then recovering it, similar to the process used in an SXCW copper oxide type plant, but with multiple steps of precipitation to extract not only the copper, but the gold and silver, the endium and gallium, and the lead and zinc. And so uh, looking at the concentration of metals, first five-year mine plan, you're looking at about 58 grams, or almost two ounces of silver equivalent per ton, with an operating cost at $18 silver price, so you know, roughly a little less than half of today's at about 15 grams. So a very good ratio between your contained metal value and your economic operating cost. Project benefits from good infrastructure. Uh, both our projects are, in, are great uh, in terms of their development infrastructure, road access from two different directions. Uh, this is a major gas and uh, electrical power line. Uh, so we've got commercial scale power, electricity, and gas nearby. And Bolivia has some of the least expensive power uh, on the continent. Um, commercial rates for electricity are around four cents a kilowatt hour. And gas-based power, because they're the largest producer of gas in South America, is around three cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, our next study is actually going to be looking at gas-based power, because you get the benefit of the lower cost and the byproduct heat that's generated that can help uh, heat your fluids and provide better leach kinetics and recovery rates. Uh, this is the study. It's, um, this is from last year, so this is going to be updated uh, very near uh, term, but it still think gives a, a relevant perspective on the project. So May 2001, at the time, the three-year average price for metals, silver was around $18. We used the trough pricing from 08-09 on Indian Mangalium of 500 a kilo, so that was the low in the economic uh, slowdown. Uh, we use a mid-price case of about $25 an ounce, which is closer to the three-year average price today as well. Uh, 40,000 ton per day heap leach, 15-year mine life, producing 160 million ounces of silver out of our 370 million ounce resource in total. That was 13.2 million ounces in the first five years and about 10.5 million ounces a year life of mine. And on the indium side, about 80 tons of indium, about 15 tons of gallium. Uh, we are looking at expanding throughput in this next study. We're looking at uh, going towards 70,000 tons per day in a staged operation. Uh, and that's going to help us, we believe, uh, move towards 18 to 20 million ounces of production a year, which would make this uh, truly one of the world's largest silver mines. You can see, even with the smaller operation that we're looking at here, very robust cash flows and MPVs on a per share basis. Uh, you're looking at uh, $7 a share roughly and $14 a share at 18 and 25 respectively. Very fast uh, payback. It is dominantly a silver project. 70% of the cash flow at base case prices is silver. We get a nice credit here from indium and gallium, copper, lead, and zinc. This kind of pays for mining, if you will, from those credits. Looking at how this stacks up uh, against um, other companies in the sector, uh, this hasn't been updated yet, but this is last year's CPM yearbook uh, producers. Uh, shown in silver are the producing mines. Shown in green are the development stage assets. The largest being Barrick Gold's Pascalama mine. Then Sumitomo's uh, San Cristobal is the next largest producing asset. Uh, you've got Tahoe Resources in Guatemala, Pan American Silver in Argentina, Panoles, Gold Quartz, Penasquito Mine, and then us. Um, with our target to increase production towards 18 to 20 million ounces, that would move us up into this category in the top five producers of silver at those kind of production levels. Um, so really standing out as a world-class asset. And on an operating cost basis, uh, we're looking at costs in the lower quartile of producer costs. Uh, so somewhere in this kind of uh, 3 to $5 range 
is the estimated operating cost on a per ounce basis. So qu quite attractive if you're a major producer looking for a high throughput project, long mine life, you want low operating costs as, as terms of your targets that you'd be taking a look at. <clears throat> Switching now to the Escalones project uh, quickly, um, 400 million tons, about 0.4 copper, add in the other metal content, you come to an equivalent of about a half a percent copper. So this is pretty average grade in the sector. 400 million tons, be very large by precious metal standards, but it's a fairly modest porphyry. Uh, lots of room to continue to grow this. Excellent infrastructure, road accessible from Santiago, about 100 kilometers to the southwest. Mature mining district, the El Teniente complex, which includes the world's largest underground copper mine and smelter is here. Uh, road accessible, gas pipeline across the property, so really a great address from an infrastructure point of view. Actively drilling now, we've got two drills on site. We're just wrapping up with the winter season approaching. 30 drill holes made up the resource. Uh, we've got a half a dozen new holes that have been drilled in this first phase of the campaign. We'll finish up the second phase uh, in the second half of the year uh, as we get into the spring. Uh, we're looking to put out an updated resource on the project, do the metallurgical test work to be able to support a uh, first preliminary economic assessment by year end. And I think this will be quite good in terms of trying to daylight the value. Um, you know, an analogy here, uh, when I was at Novigold, my last company, in 2003, we acquired the Galore Creek project from Rio Tinto, uh, about 5 billion pounds of copper. It took almost 18 months before the market was really valuing that asset in our shares. Uh, so it can take time for the market to digest such a big change. And so I'm not completely surprised, and especially in light of the recent difficult market conditions that we haven't seen full value accrete to this asset yet. Uh, but I anticipate that we will see that asset value come in, particularly as the market starts to see the drill results, the engineering, and the economics that I think we'll be able to demonstrate on this project. Uh, looking at a bubble chart for copper, similar kind of pattern. One thing you'll notice is the scarcity of development stage copper assets uh, globally. These are all the North American listed copper companies. One would argue a four billion pound copper asset, an average early stage is worth about $100 million, so about a dollar a share for us. At feasibility, if you don't grow the resource at all, maybe you're looking at a $400 million valuation in the market today. And in production, you'd sit somewhere like a capstone uh, copper mountain in terms of value, a billion dollar asset once uh, built and produced. We believe this asset has a lot of room to grow, however, and we would expect the trajectory to go from here uh, upwards into here, maybe, maybe Lumina or NGEX might be bigger or better analogs in terms of what we think the potential of this asset is. So what are the key milestones that you could expect as an investor in South American silver over the next six to 12 months? Uh, we produced a major engineering update last year uh, on the Malcocota study that was well received by the market, helped take us to new highs. Uh, exploration is currently underway uh, on the project. Uh, we've got a target to do drill 20,000 meters this year and in infill and expansion work. We've got this engineering update that's gonna be coming out uh, here in June, which we're looking at a significant expansion of production uh, throughput and optimization. Uh, feasibility work will start in the second half of the year moving into next year. Uh, on Escalones, uh, looking here on this project, the drill results as we're starting to wind down this first phase of this year's program, uh, the test work and resource to help support that first PEA to daylight the economics on this project. So maybe I'll, uh, I'll end with a bit of a value slide. Um, <laughs> You know, I think uh, sometimes when you're looking at a sector, it's hard to distill it down to, well, what am I really buying when I buy a share in these companies? And one of the ways it's quite easy to quickly get a sense of what's the value intrinsically in a company is divide their resource base into their uh, share capital to get a sense of how many ounces per share of whatever metal I'm looking at or pounds of metal I have. In the silver space, uh, already compared to investing, say, in an ETF, you get tremendous leverage. The average is about $16 of silver per dollar invested in the shares um, relative to an ETF, which would be one-to-one, -one, clearly. Uh, in a company like South American Silver, where you've got such a large resource base with such a modest market cap, you end up with tremendous leverage, almost $70 worth of metal value per dollar invested in the shares. Uh, so even in our case, if we were to double and double again, uh, we'd still be a cheaper value than the average story here on, on the screen. So I think the opportunity for us to continue uh, to outperform uh, the sector longer term is, is excellent. 
Uh, it's been a rough patch here, but I think as investors looking at our space, and clearly because you're at the conference, you're considering investment in the space, you really couldn't pick a better time. This is one of those times where it may feel difficult to be looking at the sector, but I think it's one of those times that's probably the right time to be looking at the sector. The sector is trading at values we haven't seen but just a handful of times in the last decade. And I think there's a very good chance we're going to see significant uh, capital appreciation once the market turns uh, and we start to see investors starting to value these things on their intrinsic value. So with that, I'm, uh, I'm done with my slides, um, but we could uh, open it up for, for any questions. Uh, Greg, you, uh, you touched on uh, this uh, strategic investment stake by the, quote, Asian Technology Group. And uh, according to your presentation, they invested at a premium to market. Could you give us some background on their identities uh, and the rationale for their investment and some background on your conversations with them, et cetera? Yeah. Um I, I took my first trip to Asia about five years ago for Nova Gold when we were looking at strategic potential investors for Galore Creek Copper Gold System and was really impressed with the scale of the market there, the interest in resources, particularly those that are based on the Pacific Rim. Uh, working with some of the groups uh, when I moved over to South American Silver that I'd worked with at, at Nova Gold, we identified a number of parties that were particularly interested uh, not only in the silver but in the technology metals and because this is an area that we're not specialists in indium and in the actual technology itself we saw huge value in cultivating that relationship over the last couple of years uh, we were recognizing that uh, as a strategic metal uh, the UN, the U.S. Department of Energy have all been talking about indium and gallium along with some of the heavy rare earths as potentially subject to shortage uh, it's been in the news that China's been restricting exports of these metals, so it seemed like a natural fit. Their interest in companies that were developing projects, our interest in need for capital. Uh, so we rolled those relationships that we've developed over the last couple of years into a first equity investment. It was actually done at a premium to the market, a $1.60 investment, uh, with uh, about a 5%, 6% premium to where we were trading that on a five-day VWAP basis at the time. Uh, those parties are interested in helping to facilitate a world-class scale new project in indium and gallium. Uh, the groups are based in Taiwan, many of them being either specialty materials manufacturers or end users, Korea, uh, interest in, from Japan, and interest also out of, of Hong Kong and other parts of China as well. Uh, and the idea being this investment could help facilitate advancement of the project. These parties, we would anticipate, will have a strong interest in looking at offtake as the project advances and really can get to the point where it's understood what level of production we're looking at, what the cost structure looks like, the capital cost to a higher degree of refinement. So I think this is really key uh, in terms of being able to bring their interest in, allowing us to learn more about the Indian market uh, from them and to be able to, to advance the project. Secondly, uh, and also important for us as a company, because we've already seen significant investment into Bolivia by Asian groups, the Koreans are investing in a copper project, a major lithium project, the Chinese have signed heads of state agreement on a lithium project with Bolivia. We saw these groups as also bringing an extra kind of piece of mitigation, if you will, on the geopolitical risk component. When we go to transition from exploration license to mining license and sitting down to negotiate our mining contract, we think it could be quite useful to have groups that already have relationships with the government uh, there at the table. They're already investors now and owners in the company. They may be at some point owners in the project, and we think it's a good way for us to be able to move forward and maximize the value and get the best possible structure in place that we can. What, what is the actual next step in, in the process that you're in right now? Yeah, so on the Silver Indian project, we're going to be, with the completion of this next uh, engineering update, we'll be moving into feasibility work. So that's going to comprise additional drilling to take uh, any remaining inferred in-pit material into M&I so it can become reserves. That's going to uh, entail doing additional drilling because we've got several zones that remain open to expansion, so we want to know whether those can possibly go into an optimized uh, feasibility resource reserve. Uh, in addition, we're continuing to do detailed metallurgical test work. We've been doing about four years of that test work with SGS Labs. 
And during the feasibility process, we'll also want to do pilot scale test work on site to test heap leaching under ambient climate conditions on site. Uh, so over the next 18 uh, to 24 months, we'll be carrying out that work. Uh, concurrently, we're collecting our environmental baseline uh, information on the project. We're working with the same engineering firm that worked with Sumitomo, uh, Pan American, and Coeur d'Alene. Uh, we're compiling that information and so we can start the permitting process uh, probably sometime next year uh, to be able to look at positioning the company potentially for a construction decision in 2014. Um, our concept is probably a staged construction concept where we would start building, say, the first heap leach pad uh, and then stage up with the second pad to come on a stream to build the full scale. That can help manage the capital needs of the project and allow us to, to get everything worked out with a smaller uh, project to start with. Now, should we become partnered or taken out by a bigger party, they may decide they want to go full hog right from the beginning, and your economics would certainly suggest that's your best way to get your, your highest economics. Uh, this project is also scalable well beyond the levels that we're looking at um, because of the wide nature of the ore body and the fact that it starts right at surface and is directly leachable. Uh, so one could certainly see this going beyond the 70,000 level per tons per day that we're, we're envisioning today to a much higher level of production. On the copper asset, uh, at this point, it's getting that first, that drilling completed, that first set of metallurgical work done so that we can put out a first preliminary economic assessment, start to scope the project. Uh, and from there, understanding how much further drilling do we need to do, more detailed metallurgical work, and starting to move that into that engineering pipeline as a, as a second key asset for the company. Well, thank you very much. I think, uh, I think we've taken our, our allotted time. Uh, if any of you have any further questions, I will be around uh, for the next little while. Be happy to sit down and meet with you and go into any of this in more detail than we have at, at this point. Uh, invite you to take a look at our website. We have the links to all the technical reports uh, for these if you'd like to get into to more detail or to contact us at our office uh, with all the contact information available on the website. So thank you very much. <laughs>